we'd like to spend a little bit of time sharing with you the SEER principles um, and sort of how we envision them as supporting open science. Uh, we are going to um, talk specifically about pre-registration, data sharing, and replication, and the things that we've been supporting. And we can talk a little bit about where things are going um, in relationship to, to that particular line of inquiry. And then we'll talk about our current and future public access requirements for IES funded projects. You're going to get to hear me for a little while, and then I'm going to um, turn the floor over to Laura, and hopefully this will be understandable and enjoyable for everyone who's here. All right, the SEER principles. So for those of you who haven't been part of um, the SEER principle evolution, this was one of Director Schneider's initial attempts to pull together best practices in making sure that the work that we have been supporting, we in the education space, and particularly at IES, um, so that we can make sure that it's both transparent, actionable, and focused on outcomes that, if you will, matter the most, right? So that we can improve outcomes, particularly achievement and attainment. Um, we have been bu building rigorous evidence building since 2002. And what SEER, the SEER principles are intended to do is to complement the What Works Clearinghouse's strong focus on internal validity by coming up with a, a set of standards that we can all try to implement in our work as appropriate across the two research centers, across the evaluation centers, and hopefully beyond just IES. Put the link in there if you've not been to the, the pages. There's lots of resources there, and I'm going to highlight just a few as we go through the, the deck here. So. The SEER, the SEER principles, we have nine of them. Um, the two that we're going to spend most of the time on, our time on today is on this, this requ request requirement expectation that we pre-register studies. And then the second, the expectation that we should be making findings, methods, and data open. I don't think I have to convince anyone on this call that that's incredibly important. Um, I do also want to draw everyone's attention to uh, the bullet that's third in the list, which is our newest SEER, SEER principle, which is focused on addressing equities and inequities in learners' opportunities, access to resources, and outcomes. That's a brand new uh, principle that we're continuing to develop and learn about, but stay tuned for more of that in a later conversation. So pre-registration. Hopefully this is not new to anyone on the call, um, but in the IES universe, one of the things that we do is in our RFAs, we require causal impact studies to be pre-registered in a recognized study registry so that we can have information documenting confirmatory research questions and their planned analytic activities. One of the nice things about the study registry process, as you all know, is that that should continue to be updated as and if things change. During the time of COVID, this has been incredibly an incredibly important um, opportunity, I think, for us to think about how do we talk about how things have been changing in response to an external event that we did not have any way to plan or prepare for. We've been happy to see that pre-registration People are doing it, right? People are doing what they've been asked to. Um, and just for a point of information, I did a little bit of research trying to figure out where are our studies being pre-registered. Most of them to date are in Reese. The oh, I should I should have figured out what that is. That's through the Society for Research and Educational Effectiveness. So there's 166 IES funded studies. And just to be clear, that includes both studies funded through the two research centers, as well as studies funded through the National Center for Evalu uh, Education Evaluation. I was only able to find 14 IES funded studies in, the, uh, in OSF, but I have a feeling that's probably an underestimate. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we're encountering that we would love to think together with you all about how to solve. Um, and in clinicaltrials.gov, I was able to locate seven IES funded studies because we do fund work, particularly in the social and emotional um, mental health space where there's overlap between the NIH type studies that you find in clinicaltrials.gov and the work that we support. The next piece is sharing findings and methods. I, you'll notice that we put openness as findings, methods, and data. So findings and methods is actually where we first started. So with the initial public access memo that was released um, in 20, 2013, yeah, 2013, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, um, we put a policy together to make sure that all of the research that your tax dollars were paying for would be available to the public who don't necessarily have access through through libraries, right, and repositories to find to find the manuscripts. So now all of 
all IS grantees are to submit electronic versions of their final accepted manuscripts to ERIC. We've specifi specified a repository for our grantees. Um, what we have seen is an increasing number of IES funded publications in ERIC, which is fabulous. Um, and we're working right now with our journal community, trying to figure out ways to renegotiate our agreements so that to reduce the burden on folks like yourselves, on librarians who are ser uh, servicing scholars and on the scholars themselves to see if we can get journals to automatically deposit content. Um, but if journals are not doing that, then grantees need to, to actually submit a grantee submission uh, to, to Eric. And what we have seen is, like I said, increasing compliance. Um, I checked this morning, we have 2,704 grantee submission records in ERIC. Not all of those are yet publicly available because there is still a 12 month embargo for many journals. But we're happy to see this. I think the first time I presented this slide, it was something like 200. So we're seeing lots and lots of uh, improvement in compliance for which we are very excited. Data share. This is a challenge particularly for those of us in the education research sector. We, we want to enforce this, right? You need to share your final research data, but there are concerns about privacy. Um, there are concerns that come also from where the data is that you're getting. So if you're doing original data co collection, you can provide access to research data relatively straightforwardly. However, if you're using data from a state or local um, administrative system, you actually may not be permitted to share that data. You can, however, share code. So when we're talking about data sharing and trying to figure out the degree to which our grantees are actually able to do what we're asking them to do, um, we look both for the presence of code as well as for the presence of data itself. How are folks doing? Oops, no, sorry, I skipped ahead. Um, <laughs> we do provide lots of resources. And I believe that there was a session that Ruth Neild led earlier in the unconference talking about this uh, publication that came out of the National Center for Education Evaluation about sharing study data. So, so um, Ruth Neal and her colleagues prepared this in service of our funded community, but really in service of the broad community. So I hope that session went well, would love feedback about what are you missing? What more do you need? Um, and there's an upcoming IES SHRI webinar talking about studying, uh, sharing study data uh, that's available on March the 28th. So if you all are interested in continuing to talk about this, please sign up and join and join that meeting. So where are IES data, funded data being stored? The data sharing component of our public access policy was instantiated several years after the initial policy. And as I was looking and pulling information together, I was looking for a needle in a haystack image. I couldn't find it, but this is almost the same, right? Um, finding the data is actually not easy. Eric has created um, a place in the publication, like when you put your publication in, there's like a field you can complete to say where your data is being stored, but that is relatively new. So right now I was spending time going, well, I know ICPSR has data. I know OSF has data. A lot of other data is living in university managed repositories across the nation. So discoverability is going to be something that is going to be pre preoccupying us as we're thinking about how to actually make the promise of open science truly, um, truly be enacted. In terms of direct support in replication, right? So why do we want to uh, share data? In part, we want to share data so that we can replicate study findings, so that we have the opportunity to build knowledge together and to build knowledge collectively across many studies. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the work um, that we've been doing in replication, in 2018, I think the last unconference, Christina Chin and Katie Taylor presented the findings from um, from this paper, which is the first link there, we went back and reanalyzed all of our grants that had been funded to do efficacy work. And one of the things that we learned is that there was a ton of replication work happening, but people just weren't calling it replication. So 
<laughs> we were like, okay, what's happening here? So we worked with our colleagues at the National Science Foundation to come up with guidelines, shared guidelines on how to do rep uh, replication and reproducibility and education research as we realized that this was happening but not being discussed and framed. We also then supported Brian Nosek and on folks, uh, no, not Brian Nosek, it was Brian Cook um, and other colleagues to develop the SARA, the Special Education Research Accelerator, which is again an attempt to support accelerated work and possible future replication. Mark Schneider came, we had a conversation. Replication work had always been supported under our broad open competitions. We decided to pull out systematic replication as a separate request for application competition notice um, in 2020, where we were trying to really provide some guidance to the field about where we thought replication could really serve the needs of the education sciences community most well. So we launched that. Um, then in 2021, we were like, okay, well, let's continue to think about other ways we could do replication, right? Not simply replicating a study, sort of taking a design and replicating it, but could we do replications internal to all of the digital learning platforms where kids are doing ex doing like their their studies, where they're reading, where administrators are learning about uh, student outcomes? What could we do with a digital learning platform? So we established CIRNET. Um, which is sort of the platforms themselves. And this year we will soon be hopefully announcing um, some research grantees who are going to try this out and see how does replication, could replication even actually work in the context of these digital learning platforms. And we're continuing to work with Sarah and support the work of the Special Education Research Accelerator. So what happened when we pulled out systematic replication? What, what's been interesting is that we have 15 funded projects across the two IES research centers. The initial set of awards that we made were, there were more of them made in special education than in the education research center. So individuals were trying to see whether high quality interventions with evidence of efficacy, working with general populations could be replicated when used with students who um, had identified special education needs. As the years have gone by, it's become more balanced. I think we currently have eight of those projects funded in, in Nixer and seven in NCER. So we're continuing to build out on replication and I'm really interested and excited to see what we learned from this and to see how the data that comes from these studies can be archived and used for other purposes as we're moving down the line, right, as we're continuing to advance our knowledge about how best to support students in classrooms. What are some of the problems we've noticed? Um, discoverability is a huge one, and I think this is a really interesting conversation for the open science community because in many ways the premise of open science is that it will enable new work to happen more quickly and more rapidly. But it does rest on this assumption, at least in part, that you can find the data that you're looking for. And, um, and, and yet maybe you can't, right? So I wanna just throw that out there. I'd love to have a conversation about suggestions that you all might have around how we can, we at the federal government can think about supporting discoverability and work in the discoverability space. I think the other piece that we've been thinking a lot about is how do we incentivize routine compliance, right? How do we make open science a normal part of all science? I will say that when I was looking at the ICPSR data in terms of where the data is and who was there, I was really gratified to see that many of our training fellows are actually um, archiving their data in ICPSR. These are individuals who are completing pre and postdoctoral training uh, through through funding that, that, that IES provides. So that's one pathway. Um, but what else could we be doing to really help make sure that everyone is putting their data um, and, their, and their studies and their methods, like it's just part of the process. Like how do we, how do we change that and make it more, make open scholarship the norm? Um, I talked a little bit already about the training programs. I think the other thing we're thinking a lot about is um, how do we talk about impact? And it's in scare quotes because as an IESer, if I talk about impact and I'm not talking about uh, a causal study, I would get myself in trouble. But this is in the common parlance. Like this is a, a change we made. We've been putting it in place. You know, it's been in place for about 10 years. How do we make sure that what we're intending is actually what's happening? Um, 
So I'm going to talk really quickly about sort of past and current public access requirements. Laura, unless you were going to do this, so this is me, right? <laughs> Sorry, I can't see. Either way. Do you want to do it? You want to jump in or you want me to do it? I can okay, jump why in. Why don't you jump in? And okay. I'm going to let Laura talk a little bit here and she can talk about these because she's going to go into the, the future work, which is where we're Yeah, really... so we're going to try to create like a, a narrative thread of like where we've come to where we're going. Um, and so so this is, and if you want to go to the next slide, Liz, this is a little bit um, uh, redundant with what Liz has already shared, but just to sort of like get us to where we are now. So um, IES established publication and data sharing requirements for IES grants starting in fiscal year 2012, but that those policies were sort of established in 2011. So ahead of any of the sort of um, cross-government um, uh, requirements. In 2013, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, um, OSTP for short, published the Holdren Memo, so named for the then uh, head of the OSTP, John Holdren, um, to provide guidance on the need for federally funded researchers to start systematically sharing publications and developing plans for sharing data. Um, so that was a sort of starting point for all agencies that provide federal funding for research across disciplines and across um, the different programs um, to start to have some consistent standards. Um, in 2016, Department of Education established a public access guide and policy to sort of formally implement the recommendations and requirements within that Holdren memo, um, which was not a huge sort of uh, upheaval for those folks who were funded by IES because our requirements had been in place um, for quite some time. But it sort of laid out in more formal terms from a, a policy perspective as opposed to most of the ways that we sort of signal requirements is through our RFAs, but this is sort of a more um, cross-cutting um, uh, policy guidance. Um, so moving to the next slide. So this is sort of a, mine's not advancing. Sorry, there we go. Thank you, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, so this is sort of a review um, and sort of expansion on what Liz just shared. Oops, there we go. Um, so there are current access, public access requirements that, that exist within IES for publications. As Liz shared, IES requires all peer-reviewed scholarly publications produced with IES funding to be made available in ERIC, um, either, 12, uh, either after a 12-month publisher embargo or after publication um, for those who are publishing open access. Um, so the idea is that you, you get it in there <laughs> when it's, when it's uh, accepted or published, um, that there is this 12-month embargo for many um, articles that are not published using um, article processing uh, charges, um, but, and the other piece of our sort of current policy around this is that grants are, uh, grantees are allowed to use funds from the awards to pay article processing costs in order to support op open access publishing. Um, and then with respect to data sharing, um, exploratory and any causal impact projects um, are required to submit as part of their grant application, a data management plan um, and to have specific plans for making data accessible post-publication. So that's kind of where we are now. So where we're going, <laughs> um, and Brian Nozick answered some questions yesterday about um, sort of the, the, the game changer uh, question about um, the new OSTP public access memo. Um, and so we did wanna take a little bit of time to talk about what's in there and what the implications are in a little bit more detail. Um, we're sharing the memo rather than IES's or the Department of Education specific plan um, because the memo was released in August of this past year. We've been given a certain amount of time to get a plan in place, um, all, all agencies, all federal funding agencies, um, and we'll be sharing those out once, <laughs> once we have those to share. Um, it's the federal government. We don't turn on a dime here, so there's going to be some time to... Um, uh, sort of develop these plans and implement them. So, you know, IES is motivated to sort of embrace a lot of these principles um, and will likely sort of implement some of these things in advance of when there's an official policy in place across federal government and across um, the Department of Education. We will signal those things in our RFAs. Um, we'll certainly also share out, you know, supporting information as we have it. But we thought it would be useful to kind of walk through, and some of these things are, bigger game changers with respect to how they're gonna influence your day-to-day -day and month-to-month and year-to-year life. Um, other things are sort of more 
devil in the details kinds of things, but that will actually have some implications for kind of how you do business moving forward. So we wanted to kind of walk through those things um, one by one. We've got identified some things that we have anticipated, and Liz has already signaled some of them, um, as sort of pain points or challenges for the community in sort of embracing these. And we definitely, as Liz said, would like to hear from you about what are some unanticipated challenges to navigate, what are some ideas that you have for ways to help equip the field, especially, you know, we're a little bit preaching to the choir here <laughs> with respect to, to people who are sort of already embracing open science. Um, but if there are folks who are struggling to figure out, you know, Brian talked yesterday about, um, you know, people people are there, they're ready, they just don't know how, they don't know where, they don't know when, sort of what, what are some ways that we can help to message um, and simplify that process. So just to kind of walk through the memo, um, uh, one of the, the main foci of this um, memo and sort of the, the goal in keeping with kind of White House strategy in general right now is a focus on fostering equity in science. And so, you know, this, we can talk a lot about um, how open science helps to facilitate um, uh, trustworthiness, as Brian talked about yesterday, but we can also think about it as kind of leveling the playing field with respect to access, right? So instead of having to track down somebody that you know and have met at a conference to try to finagle your way into getting access to their data, the data are just available. Um, so that's that's sort of a, a broad framework. Oh, and I was going to share the link to the memo. Um, it's called the Nelson Memo because Alondra Nelson was the acting head of OSTP at the time that the, the memo was issued, um, as, a, as opposed to the Holdren memo from 2013. Um, so it, it gets into a lot of details. It's really guidance for federal agencies, but you can certainly sort of read the tea leaves um, about what, how it's gonna get translated into practice for researchers. Um, so the, go ahead, please. yeah. So the guidance will not be implemented officially or is not required to be implemented officially until the end of 2026. Um, so we've got time to be figuring these things out, um, but uh, we're working on them. And as I mentioned, IES is likely to start to implement some of those things in advance of that deadline. The biggest one that's caused a lot of attention, that's attracted a lot of attention is that the 12 month embargo is going away. So right now, if you publish an article, there's a 12 month embargo that gives publishers a chance to um, make some money off of the article. Um, through subscriptions and, and downloads um, before uh, they have to make it open and available uh, because before you have to make it open and available. And the, the exception to that, of course, is if you are paying APCs in order to publish open access. Um, effective as of 2026, um, all articles must be available, freely available to all on the day that they are published. Um, and the, the sort of consequential, you know, implications is that those should be shared and sort of uploaded, right, um, into the appropriate archives that the funding agencies have specified by that, by the date, uh, on the date of publication. So that, that is, that is the sort of overarching charge. The devil's in the details with respect to the implementation, and that's where you're going to want to go. And, you know, again, all agencies are being required to do this and are developing these policies. So if you have NSF funding as well as IES funding, You'll, you'll want to look at the agency specific guidelines about how that's going to get implemented. The other big piece is that for many of you may not be too traumatic, <laughs> um, but is something to note, which is that data sharing will be required at the time of publication for all data generated from fun federally funded sources, or if the data are unpublished after a certain time interval following the data collection, you will be required to share your unpublished data. Um, so whichever comes first, and each agency is currently figuring out <laughs> what that time window is gonna be. Um, if it's gonna be sort of the, the date at which the grant closes or a certain amount of time after that, or a certain amount of time after you finish data collection, the agencies will be providing those kinds of specifications, but this is new. Um, and what it means is if you are collecting data from a federal grant, uh, off of a federal grant, and you publish some of it, but you are sort of hanging on to some of it for some subsequent um, analysis, at some point you are going to be expected to share those data, regardless of whether you've published them or not. Um, so something to sort of be aware of. Another piece to be just, and this is not sort of mandated in the, in the memo, but something to be aware of is that many agencies 
signaling the support for sharing and not just data management practices are shifting what they call their plan from a data management plan to a data sharing and management plan, or sometimes a data management and sharing plan. So expect to see a different acronym forthcoming. Um, there's going to be, and I've got a second slide on this just to sort of unpack this a little bit more. Um, there's requirements in the memo for consistent use of unique digital persistent identifiers. Um, we already have some of those. <laughs> sure, Robert. Um, we already have some of those in play that we are all familiar with, um, but there's going to be um, some evolution in what's expected. Um, and so I'll go, to, I'll go on to that in just a second. And then I think I have one more bullet on this slide. This. There we go. Yeah, and then this is also, this is kind of a devil in the details kind of piece, but you'll it'll make, um, you know, sort of uploading things or sharing things a little bit more um, finicky with respect to fields to fill in is that there's going to be an expectation that, that there is inclusion of rich metadata when sharing either publications or data. Um, and there's some specifications about what those metadata should include, which also includes those unique persistent identifiers. Um, so let's flip to the next slide. Um, so unique digital persistent identifiers are very important for tracking, <laughs> for reporting, um, so for the federal government trying to sort of keep track and keep tabs on what's happening with the funding that it's giving, um, with what happens with respect to the trainees and the sort of placements that, that um, they get after going through training, it facilitates discoverability from the, from the funder side, from the publisher side, but also importantly from the researcher side. And, you know, I, I always say, you know, if, it, if a data set falls in the woods and nobody knows it's there, um, it's, it's as if it never got shared. Um, and as Liz was highlighting, there's there's not sort of some consistent patterns with respect to knowing exactly where to look to find things. Um, and hopefully we can use digital tools, metadata to start to, to map this out. The requirements in the, in the Nelson memo require that publications have unique digital persistent identifiers. We're all already familiar with DOIs, digital object identifiers. So that's sort of the, the kind of gold standard at this point for publications. It means that that is something that will persist over time. It is a unique set of identifiers with a digital um, address that you can always get to it. Um, individual researchers, including PIs and co-PIs on grants and any additional authors are also going to be expected to have unique persistent identifiers associated with them. ORCID is probably the best known of these. Um, and so, and as many of you probably know, and those of you who, who haven't uh, encountered ORCID yet, we certainly would encourage you to check it out. And um, ORCID is watching you, even if you don't know, they're keeping track of your publications. If you create a record, they will sort of uh, in ingest your um, publications into your official record. And then all of your scholarly work is findable. Um, you can also add information about your career placement. You can add information about your training up background about grants that you've gotten, um, uh, grant panels that you've served on, et cetera. Um, so there will be an expectation that each individual um, has a digital identifier that is used consistently. Um, award numbers are going to be <laughs> requiring more universal, unique digital precision identifiers. If any of you have an NSF or an IES or an NIH or a um, Department of Justice grant, you have a, a unique identifier within that agency, um, but there's going to be a system that needs to be developed so, such that every um, grant within the federal government, U.S. federal government has a consistent, uh, has a consistent um, coding pattern. Um, so that's going to be coming along at some point. And then we're also needing to, to develop and identify a set of um, digital identifiers for data sets. Um, so having all of these things have digital identifiers that are universal across um, federal funding sources um, is going to increase the likelihood that we can track information, that we can report consistently on information, and that we can find information. Um, and you can imagine that if you go to the IES um, award uh, uh, database and you look at a particular award and you see the unique identifiers for the individuals who are the PI and the co-PI, you can go to their ORCID pages, you can see where the data sets are um, and what publications have been um, issued. Um, if you go to the ORCID, you can find the, which grants, right? And so that once you've got these, these identifiers and we've got the, the fields um, for these being the metadata, 
um, for these being consistently reported, it's a much richer source and it's much more likely to, to solve the discoverability problem. I've got down there that the, the, the digital and persistent identifiers are necessary, but not sufficient. We do need to have much more of a rich um, sort of interconnectivity uh, amongst these identifiers in order to facilitate this. Um, okay, so here are some potential concerns that we have identified as you know, potential pain points that we're happy to talk more about um, or get your feedback on. Um, and then we also wanna see if there are other issues. One is of course, anxiety about managing this zero day embargo. How does this connect up with publisher policies? You know, Publishers are, for many journals are sort of offering to get things into the right databases um, for you, um, but that's gonna be a different kind of challenge if it has to be sort of on the day of publication. Um, it may not surprise some of you that some publishers are embracing this and working really hard to, to be collaborative about um, implementing this and others are more reluctant. Um, there's, you know, which version do we share? Do we share the accepted version or do we share the version that appears in print? But if there's not print anymore, right? Um, sort of, you know, what if you upload it, but it doesn't appear right when you sort of upload it? <laughs> um, are you in violation? You know, so we will certainly be, um, developing um, sort of guidance on an agency by agency level about that. Um, another concern that has come up and we've, we've heard from this from individuals, from societies, from um, university libraries is that APC based models, which is sort of the assumption if we're gonna make everything accessible um, are not always the most equitable. So you remember that I said that the Nelson mem memo was really sort of intended to take equity as its focus. Um, it's leveling the playing field with, with respect to access, right? Everything's open, everybody can find it if they can find it. <laughs> um, they can download it, they can use it. Um, but it requires that, that there be access to the funds to be able to publish, right? And so shifting the ecosystem in such a way that creates the expectation that things must be um, open access, hold open access through APCs um, sort of creates a barrier for those who have fewer ac access to fewer funds, who are at less resource universities, et cetera. And so that's certainly a concern that is being talked about um, right now. Um, as Liz talked about earlier, and this is something again that Brian Nosek hit on yesterday, um, sort of enculturation, um, particularly with respect to data sharing. I think there are different pockets of the field that are more versus re less receptive to these ideas. Um, you know, certainly those that work with administrative data, you know, you're, you're capitalizing on accessibility of data, but, um, and, you know, many of you are routinely sharing data, um, so have adapted, um, but what are some of the barriers um, to, uh, to shifting to a model where you are routinely sharing your data at the time of publication or even perhaps before? Um, there are obviously concerns with respect to protecting proprietary and or sensitive um, information with data sharing. Um, and certainly there are, there's lots of guidance out there. There's lots of support out there, but in terms of the policies that institute, that funding agencies are going to be instituting, um, you know, where are those protections? How, how does one document or make a case for not sharing particular data that might be a of concern, that's all something that we will obviously need to address and make contact with in our new policies. And then adapting to this new sort of emphasis on um, metadata and particular persistent identifiers is something that we will obviously all need to get, <laughs> get used to and adapt to. So um, I will pause there, Let, uh, but you know, I do think that there, are, we certainly wanna hear from you with other issues to consider. And Liz, I'll kick it back to you. Um, to round out the last couple of slides. You don't have to unmute yourself. You're mute. Sorry, I was pushing the wrong button. You know, you would think after like three years in pandemic mode, I'm like pushing this button, like why won't it unmute me? Okay, so the other thing is that as a funding agency, <laughs> It is it is incumbent upon us to share with you a QR code that takes you to our funding ops page. I hope that many of you on the phone are well aware of it. You will notice that there's nothing new up there yet, but there will be things coming very soon and very quickly. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone had access to this page. Please bookmark it if you're interested in applying for funding. 
sign up for our news flash um, because our news flash will tell you when we publish a notice inviting applications, when there's something in the federal register, it'll give you a sense of our timeline. Um, as you guys know, we got our budget very late in December. And so we were waiting to figure out what our budget was going to look like before we made uh, decisions about which competitions to move forward with. We now have that information. We are working as quickly as we can to, to get uh, requests for applications prepped and out to the community. Um, I do also want to say that for some of you all may have noticed that we sent out a request for information on topics for R&D centers. This is a different kind of openness that I, I am hopeful uh, folks will appreciate. We're really trying to think about what are the next centers that we're going to be competing. These are our big five to $10 million investments. Um, we were super pleased. We received over 80 responses, um, including responses from individuals, as well as responses from, um, from sort of uh, aggregations of societies. So we're working through that and we will be sharing back with the field what we've learned uh, and let you know where we decide to go in terms of our next investments. So that's pretty exciting, um, at least from my perspective. So I was really glad to see engagement from the community around that. And again, I got to move my book, my thing. Um, Emails are here. Uh, Laura and I will be happy to answer any questions offline, connect you up with our program officers who might be subject matter experts in the area that you want to do future research in. Um, if you're not following us on Twitter or Facebook, please do. Um, it, and explore our Inside IES research blog. It's one of uh, my favorite things not only because I pushed really hard to make sure we had it, um, but also because it gives us a way to showcase not only the research, but also the researchers that we are developing who are doing the work so we can recognize awards that everyone is getting. And honestly, it's a super fun part of my job because I have to read every single one of the blogs before they go up. So I think that's it. I think then the next, oops, oh, I didn't mean to go to black. I'll leave this up. Um, we are open for questions. We want to talk. I know there's been chat going on. David, do you want me to stop sharing and we can all put everybody's pictures up so people can talk or how? Okay. All right. Yeah. Go ahead and do that. Yeah. All right. I will stop sharing. Sorry. If I can push the right button. Haha. <laughs> I did it. Um, <laughs> so. Thank you for that great interview. Sure. Um, as questions come in, we'll start um, uh, popping them your way. The first one I saw from Stacy, and then I'll, if I um, have a blank moment, I'll uh, take the moderator's prerogative. Um, but Stacy's asking if there's a way to, um, or, or have there been talks about how to better standardize data documentation with things like um, um, uh, you know, code books to describe exactly what's in the data sets because so much open data is um, not shared very well, to put it. Lightly. So Sarah, that's a really good question. I know that um, that the guidebook or the, the sort of sharing data that Ruth Neal talked about has a little tiny bit of that information, but it sounds to me like that's a resource that, the, that would be really, really helpful if we could prepare as a fee, uh, at IES and share it out with the field. I know that um, in the NIH data sharing and management plan. There has been, there is that sort of their information, there's discussion about it, but you're right. Standardization is absolutely critical for us to be able to find, uh, to be able to pull data together in a consistent and systematic way. Just as a sidebar, we're doing a digital modernization project at IES trying to get our website like into the 21st century as opposed to like the 19th century, which is where it feels like it is. Um, and it's been really, really interesting because questions like the one you just posed are coming up in terms of standardizing how we use terms across the different centers who have different functions and how do we build out a system where we can uh, really be well integrated. So thank you for the suggestion. And I don't have a resource at hand, but I will definitely put it on the, the to-do list. Couple of good questions. I'll get to both of these, uh, Jesse um, and Allison. Um, Allison asks, um, "How did you do the searches for what was IES funded, um, particularly on OSF?" Um, and I'm also going to. Go yeah, ahead. And uh, before you answer, I'm going to put a little plug in for a new feature on OSF, which is tagging um, funder in in OSF projects. So, if you would describe, if you would be willing to, uh, how you did those searches for. Um, uh, IES funded work on different repositories. So I'm super old school. I put in quotes 
Institute of Education Sciences and saw what came up. <laughs> so entirely dependent upon people actually a spelling our name right, saying of and not for, um, you know, all of those various things. Some, I, you know, I, you could do education or, or Department of Education, and sometimes it's really challenging to do. Uh, you know, it just doesn't give you anything, right? I get stuff from Norway or, you know, whomever in the international community is doing that work as well. I think having a funder, a place to put the funder tag will be great. If I could put a request out, it would be even better if you could put a place for a grant number. Um, and it can be an open text field because I did try. So like on Google or on Google Scholar, I often will go on and do the initial four digits, digits, letters of our grant number. So R305 with the, um, the asterisk at the end. And that pulls up all of my pubs, but that didn't work in OSF because I was looking to see if I could do something simple through that. Um, ICPSR does have a funder blog. So I, I funder a funder tab. So I'd use that as well. The other thing that's interesting about ICPSR is it, it became apparent to me that people are uploading data in two separate ways. So one is through the traditional I, ICPSR process where people are uploading their data sets and getting a, a registry number. Again, going back to the digital persistent identifiers and other folks are, uh, are uploading it all as a function of a requirement in publishing in AERA open, and they don't appear to have an ICPSR number, at least not what I could find. So back to this question of <laughs> let's all use the same conventions so that we can actually find things, that would be super, super helpful. Absolutely. Um, Jesse asked us a question that I wanted to ask also. Uh, you, you mentioned earlier in your presentation that you had um, noticed several of the trained fellows, trained <laughs> IES fellows that later showed up uh, uh, fulfilling the, uh, the, the training uh, goals, you know, sharing data sets and so forth. Um, a similar issue, of course, exists with pre-registration. Um, there's, uh, you know, a huge uh, learning curve to what it is, why to do it, how to do it, how to do it appropriately, how to report the results. Have you um, seen any either trainings there or seen any um, seen anything that um, that that strikes your fancy or strikes your recollection as um, you know, really good examples or what's working well in that field or, or more likely where there's room for improvement? Yeah, so pre-registration is really, really interesting. So, um, and it's interesting on a couple of dimensions. So the RIS registry, which is through the Society for Research on, on Educational Effectiveness, is an, a highly structured data set, essentially, right? And it takes substantial investment of time, right? to like actually input all of your information. But because it's highly structured, for someone who's learning how to do this, it's actually probably pretty helpful, right? Because it tells you like, what are all the pieces that you need to be thinking about pre-registering, right? It's not just your hypothesis and your planned sample, it's also your analytic plans and there's all the measures you're gonna use, right? There's all of this stuff. Um, we have over the years done trainings about pre-registration at the ISPI meeting, right? In terms of saying, here are the things you need to be thinking about. Um, I'm not aware of things that are done out in the sort of public and certainly in our, if you will, our methods training. Pre-registration has not been a topic that's come up, but it's, it's definitely something worth thinking about. The other piece I'd like to put out there is that the SEER standards right now talk about pre-registration for confirmatory question, research questions. We're pushing, I'm pushing to help people think about pre-registering even your exploratory questions, right? So e <laughs> yes, Brian, yeah. Because I'm like, look, the whole point of this is it's a process. We start with questions. Those questions change. We need to understand how science evolves. And if we don't have a place to do that, then it just, we lose, we lose the opportunity. So I think OSF is one of the few places where you can in fact upload, you can pre-register anything. There's not like constraints on the kind of study that you're doing. And so this is something I've been thinking a lot about and trying to figure out how, what role can IES play in encouraging and sometimes requiring everyone to pre-register to the degree that it makes sense. But thoughts about that would be super welcome. And I'd be really happy to talk further with you all as you're thinking about this. I've got lots of thoughts, but uh, I want to okay. make sure I open up the room. <laughs> I have a feeling my email is <laughs> going to be filled with, can I talk like you can, we have a meeting? I'm like, yes, of course you can. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Let's see. Um, any other questions? 
questions. Brian Kirk recommends a, a national center for uh, generating some of these standards of um, <laughs> what right. needs to be included. Did you put it in the RFI? Did you respond to the RFI, Brian? I mean, come on. <laughs> I, 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 I am ashamed to say no. <laughs> but if I can put in a late word. <laughs> Always happy to take uh, look, suggestions. <laughs> let me um, jump in right on that point about sort of the uh, the benefits of bridge you know, all work anytime you're about to um, commence something. Um, it's one of the more... It's, one of the topics that generates more conversations uh, um, uh, amongst the research community. Uh, have you have you um, received pushback on those, or how do you um, start conversations um, when um, folks might not be familiar with it, or, or might fear that it um, is too constraining, or, or things like that? Or flip to that question. Um, Knowing that IES has really pushed for pre-registration for, pre for a long time, but a lot of the work that gets published still doesn't necessarily link back to what was registered. Um, where are you seeing opportunities for um, more education, more training, or or what um, uh, or sort of pushing the boundaries of uh, you know starting a registration um, for any type of empirical research? Uh. You know, that's a super good question. I don't know that I've thought carefully enough about it to give you a coherent response. Um, Laura, do you have you had any thoughts around all this? I know that you're, we've not talked a lot about There's a lot registrations. There, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a big question. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I'll just, you know, sort of echo my support for the whole process that, you know, the, the, the act of doing sort of creates different ways of thinking about the science. And so it's really important for us to think about some ways to structure and scaffold. Yeah, I guess, I guess what I would say, the other thing that I've been thinking a lot about is how do we work as a community? So, right, federal funders are only one piece of this whole community. So I have had the opportunity to participate as an ex officio member um, on the roundtable for open scholarship, which is thinking a lot about sort of the sub at the after the coal and is talking about aligning aligning incentives. I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with this that work. And so part of it is thinking about how do we get the sort of the universities, the uh, research firms, the scholars, the training programs, the federal and non-federal funders, the systems that support all of this to be in conversation with one another so that we can make sure that we're not sending contradictory messages, <laughs> teaching people to do things that run into each other. I think, you know, we don't have like an overall body that like governs all of this, except for perhaps um, the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, but they put out guidance and then that, you know, then we implement it. And we all are working together at the federal level to try to make sure that we're being consistent. But again, we're only one part of this conversation. So to be able to figure out how do you actually make sure that pre-registration happens for all of the studies that it should, that it's used appropriately, that we're not sort of, I saw Colleen a comment jump through um, about, about um, hypothesis hacking, right? Like how do we make sure that that's working and then feed that all the way through Everybody gets an ORCID. We're, you know, we're now requiring that for our training fellows. You know, like how do we incentivize every single piece of it from every single part of the system? Because that's the only way we're all going to move together forward. Sorry, that was a very generic answer, but that's where I went, David. That's where my brain went. <laughs> <laughs> that's where it goes. A question I know you won't be able to answer, but um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the process you're going through about deciding that embargo question um for unpublished data so at, at the end of the grant period or some period um after that what's the process that you're going through to um listen to folks who might be advocating for shorter or longer and what will the um presumably the public comment period um will um initiate or not initiate but um you know result in a lot of feedback um pushing for shorter and longer conversations yeah. how are you considering that right now yeah, super good question. You're right. There's not a lot I can say other than that. There are lots of listening sessions that are happening across government and we're all sharing 
what we're learning and what we're hearing and trying to sort of dovetail it. You know, the reality is, is that the astrophysics community has one set of responses. You know, the biomedical investigators have a different set of responses. The publishers have a third set of responses. So we're, we're just, we're really in listening mode right now, not in solutioning mode, right? Fortunately, we have time to do this. For IES specifically, we put, uh, we prevent, pre- well, I can't talk. We presented our draft plan to the Office of Science and Technology Policy a couple of weeks ago. We're waiting for feedback from them. Once we get feedback from them, we will be in a place where we can actually start to like map out um, our public comment period um, in terms of what we're going to do, right? How we're going to engage the public around this. The Department of Education is a super interesting place because we have, there's sort of two parallel tracks that are happening. I guess we can make changes through our request for applications. And we don't have to go through a listening period or a public comment period. That's not to say that we won't, but just so you guys are aware, we can make those changes. Um, For the department, they are what's called a rulemaking agency. And any changes that they're going to make will have to go through a formal rulemaking process, which means that the changes will be proposed in a federal register notice. There will be an opportunity for comments received and then responded to. So there are these sort of two things happening simultaneously. So if you guys have thoughts now, yeah, don't hesitate. Say, don't be shy. Send them to me. Send them or to us. Just turn, turning the question back. Does anybody have thoughts right now that they want to share yeah. with us while we're talking um, either about sort of, you know, pros and cons of a shorter term versus a longer term? I was about to ask, what would um, what would you like us to do as a, a lot of advocates? But I'll open the floor. I'll stop talking for a moment and encourage folks to chime in with your opinions. Sarah? I wonder if having a shorter, I mean, a shorter period might have the unintended consequence of, you know, potentially um, PIs requesting more larger grant periods than they would have otherwise to make sure that they have enough time to, you know, publish what they need to publish on the data they've collected. Yeah, that's Sarah, that's a really interesting question. We currently work within a five-year time frame, which I think is like we don't have, we can't extend past that. But certainly for shorter grants, right? We love the grants sure. where we're getting findings in two years. Um, but yeah, interesting. Okay, thanks. Yes, Brian. This really isn't a, a concrete answer so much as is just a maybe a thought. Yeah, similar um, to the previous comment, the, doing it too short may just short change the, the process, especially early on, as this is still relatively new and people are figuring it out. I think there's um, some potential dangers in, in requiring too much too early that it is just going to scare people and, and and maybe result in some shortcuts um, being taken and and the, the problems with data being shared that that is difficult to, to use or even find. Um, but balancing that, obviously, you don't want it five years <laughs> down the line or something. It it doesn't do any good then. So I don't know what that, um, what what that Goldilocks zone is of, of of getting it quick but not too quickly. Yeah. yeah, I think if you guys haven't read the Nelson memo, and folks, it's actually worth reading, um, in part because it uses the example of what happened during the pandemic early on. When we were trying to understand what was going on and how critical open science was to coming up with solutions. So, so that in many ways is a insight into the hopes, right? of what can happen if we are more quickly able to share both data and findings. Um, but it doesn't address the second part of, of your comment, Brian, which is that there, <laughs> there may well be unintended consequences if we push too fast to, you know, to get everything out there. So, well, and hopefully there's some time to this. So maybe it yeah. will be in a better position in terms of uh, resources and educating the the awardees so that they're able to do this more quickly. And then, then I think a quicker turnaround is, is more justifiable. And I think Stacy's initial question is actually completely relevant to this, right? In terms of training people about how do you create code books that make sense, that are sensible, that actually record everything that needs to be recorded so someone else can do a good job at reusing um, reusing your data. Other questions, comments?
So listen, Laura, we're just about out of time. I want to um, extend a very warm and heartfelt thank you for taking time out of your days to um, speak to us, to share what's going on at NCER and for all of, you know, all the work that goes into uh, the process that you're going through right now. This is great. And may I ask a question of you all? There was lots of chat happening. Is there any way that I can see the chat? I was trying to pay attention. So can you guys like save that for us? Because I know when I log off, it's going to go away. Um, Because I'd love to know who I need to follow up with. That'd be fabulous. (laughs) I'll save the chat as a text file and email both of you. Perfect. Thank you all so much. And congrats on a good meeting. I have heard good comments from folks who've been able to attend. So congrats to the COS team for pulling it together. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. All right. Have a great Friday. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone. Now.